Well, good afternoon. My name is Catherine Grinberg, and I serve as the Vice President of Public Policy here at the fargo Mord West Fargo Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us virtually today. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to thank the Chamber's Public Policy sponsors. Our program sponsors, Microsoft, More Engineering, Primacy Strategy Group. Our supporting sponsors, AE2S, Beverage Wholesalers, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota, Bremer Bank, Cass County Electric Cooperative, Essentia Health, First International Bank and Trust, MWC Advertising of Fargo-Moorhead, Sanford, and Excel Energy. Thank you to all those companies for sponsoring the Chamber's robust work in public policy and advocacy. Our Primacy Strategy Group is the presenting sponsor of this summit, and policy experts with the PSG team are moderating each of these sessions. So thank you, Primacy, for this great collaboration. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Ryan Kelly. Ryan is the co-founder of Primacy Strategy Group and serves as the president and CEO, as well as on its board of governors. In addition, Ryan is the principal, synergetic, the principal of Synergetic Endeavors, a St. Paul-based consulting firm that he founded in 2005. So with that, welcome, Ryan. Thanks, Catherine. <clears throat> uh, pleasure to be here uh, with all of you today. Thanks for tuning in to what I'm sure is gonna be an exciting day uh, discussions uh, with many of our federal delegation members. Uh, first off, let me uh, start out by saying that Primacy is very proud uh, to be the presenting sponsor of this series. Uh, and I am, of course, honored uh, to moderate the first two panels uh, today. Uh, my colleague, Emily Tranter, who many of you know out in our Washington, D.C. offices, uh, will moderate the final panel uh, with Minnesota Congresswoman uh, Michelle Fishbach uh, in a live video uh, from Senator Klobuchar. Uh, this afternoon uh, and uh, appreciate uh, your government, your federal government is hard at work for you. Uh, and there uh, is a lot of activity out in Washington, D.C., uh, committee hearings being jostled uh, around and the like. So we've had to make a little bit of switch uh, in the orders uh, here today. So our opening panel is going to be with uh, Senator Hoven uh, and Congressman Armstrong, uh, a great dynamic duo. Uh, uh, they've uh, got a good ham and egg routine down, so I'm sure it's, uh, you guys will be uh, hanging on their every word. Uh, we will then uh, shift over uh, to Senators uh, Kevin Kramer and Tina Smith, and then finally Emily will round out our policy federal policy panels uh, with Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach. Uh, just a polite reminder, uh, for any of those who, uh, of you uh, who are participating here virtually uh, that have questions uh, throughout the Minnesota and North Dakota congressional delegation uh, presentations, do not forget to submit question and answers uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be uh, trying to fit in some audience uh, questions uh, as we go along. Uh, so let's go ahead and begin uh, with Congressman Armstrong. Uh, I will do a brief bio, not that uh, any introduction is needed, especially to uh, our dear friends at the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber. Uh, but uh, Congressman Armstrong was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, representing the entire state at large of North Dakota in 2018. Uh, he was uh, handily reelected in November of 2020. Congressman Armstrong serves on the House Judiciary Committee, as well as the House Oversight and Reform Committees. Uh, prior to his service in the U.S. House of Representatives, he served in the North Dakota State Senate from 2012 to 2018, with distinction, I might add, uh, was, and was chairman of the North Dakota Republican Party from 2015 to 2018, which was obviously a very active time in uh, Republican politics in North Dakota. Uh, with that, uh, please uh, help give a warm virtual welcome to our dear friend, uh, Congressman Kelly Armstrong. I'll turn it over to you, Kelly, for some opening remarks. Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. These things are always fun. Um, I think one of the things about the last two years is we've all got more comfortable doing virtual events, which uh, when we can do them in person is great, but it also gives us the opportunity to be able to multitask. Uh, if I have to ditch out of here, it's because we're getting called to vote at any given time. But uh, I uh, am so we obviously we're in the year end uh, pile up where we're waiting on everything to get done. Uh, you know, Congress, it, it, it's hard for Congress to get anything done unless the Christmas tree is up and lighted. Uh, and so we are definitely putting that to the test. But as we work forward, I, I just there's some uh, Dusty Johnson's got a uh, transparency bill on the floor rego regarding cattle markets today. The conversations about egg are always moving forward. Obviously, we had a horrible, horrible drought this summer. Uh, energy prices for our egg producers, whether it's diesel fuel, whether it's uh, anhydrous, uh, whether it's transportation, are all real problems, uh, workforce, uh, supply chain issues, all of those things which uh, every consumer across the country is feeling right now 
are exponentially multiplied when you get into the ag sector. So I'm interested to talk to you all today and uh, move forward from there. All right, uh, sounds good. I know, I think uh, Senator Hoven is uh, coming from uh, another key uh, key committee hearing or vote. So we'll uh, go ahead and uh, jump in. Uh, and Congressman, maybe we could have you, for those of us, um, uh, unlike the two of us who track uh, kind of things in, in the egg industry very closely, and especially what's happening at the federal government, perhaps you could just, uh, for some of our audience members, just kind of recap, give a brief recap of where we're at uh, since the uh, reauthorization of the Farm Bill in 2018 and, and how that process kind of plays out to set the stage. Well, yeah, obviously the Farm Bill's done, I, I mean, essentially every four years and we're working forward, but it's also a constant process, right? Like it's the definition of what is, what is going on. And like I said earlier, you know, we're always working on uh, different issues in North Dakota. I tell people I'm also, I serve on the Climate Crisis Committee. I didn't name it, but I'm on it. And a lot of times what other people call severe climate, we in North Dakota call Tuesday, uh, whether it's a flood or a blizzard or a drought or all of those different issues. And even in a state that has dealt with those issues a lot, this year was really, really uh, unique in that, I mean, we were having grass fires before we usually had our last blizzard. So even for our standards, it's been tough and dealing with those issues. So not only are you always working towards crop insurance and what you can do better for North Dakota, the sugar program is important. Um, ag research at NDSU and across the state, you know, we have the NDSU has an ag research center in Dickinson, North Dakota, but then you're also dealing with those triage issues. And whether it's whether it's drought, whether it's those different issues. And now, like I said, we're hearing a lot about workforce and labor shortage, you know, and some of those aren't policy driven. Some of them are, you know, we get a lot of custom combiners and a lot of temporary visas out of South Africa. Some of them were just as simple as the consulate wasn't open. <laughs> like because of because of the COVID rates in South Africa, there was no policy change. There was nothing that did it. But you, there are so well, we can do these things remotely. You can't, you could you can't do that remotely. So a lot of different frustrations, a lot of different issues moving forward. Uh, it, it's always it's always so pleasantly surprising to me. Our egg producers in North Dakota are the constant constant optimists. Uh, you know, no matter how bad last year is, they're looking to next year. But we're also talking about you know, carbon capture and ethanol, and doesn't matter if it's Red Trail or Castleton and dealing with those issues and adapting to the ever-changing marketplace and how that works forward. So I'm sure that'll be part of the conversation moving forward as well. I got it. Uh, thanks, Congressman. In in the, um, <clears throat> so we're kind of halfway through the process. The, the next reauthorization period for the Farm Bill comes up here in 2023, as you know. Um, are there things that you're hoping personally uh, that uh, can get included in the reauthorization bill uh, that maybe didn't uh, didn't make it in in, in 2018 uh, when you first came to Congress? And are there a few pieces that you'd like to see be omitted uh, from uh, the reauthorization in 23? Yeah, I'll start with the second one first. I'm really concerned about how they how um, depending on what the makeup of Congress is, what the climate stuff looks like in the ag bill. Um, I, I or in the farm bill. I always worry about that. Um, I, I just color me skeptical whenever the federal government says we want to cooperate with our producers to lower carbon emissions. That always sounds to me like we're going to regulate it and it's going to be more expensive. Um, I, I think we have really identified some problems that exist. Uh, I think, you know, some of these supply chain issues, some of those types of issues uh, were brought forth by COVID. But I think in a lot of cases, they just really brought to the forefront structural problems that we had before and that were willing to happen. Uh, we can't have continue to drive up the cost of inputs for our egg producers and expect that to happen. And listen, if you're a cattle producer in North Dakota and you go into a grocery store and you see that a steak is $3 more a pound and you, if you can find it, right, if you can find it. Yep. And you know, not a single dollar of that is coming back to your cattle operation. That's a problem. And it's going to continue to be a problem. So on top of the normal issues, Ryan, like we got to make sure we take our core farm programs, crop insurance, supplemental crop insurance, um, you know, for North Dakota, sugar policy is important. That actually turned into not being a huge fight in the last farm bill, but typically it's a pretty big fight. Um, but we also are going to have to start talking about making sure that we are putting our North Dakota ag producers in the best possible position to succeed. And then I also think when you're talking about biofuels 
and ethanol, biodiesel, all of that value added egg and how we're dealing with some of the uh, some of those issues are going to be really important moving forward. And it, I, it was unfortunate because when the Biden administration had their first climate day on uh, uh, as an administration, uh, you know, they didn't mention biofuels once. They didn't miss, mention ethanol. They didn't mention biodiesel. They didn't deal with those issues. And then it's not really a farm bill issue, but I don't think anybody wants the RIN system and that part of the ethanol um, economy to be taken over by the uh, EPA, which is that deadline's coming and we're going to have to address that. I got it. Well, you know, it's funny you, you mentioned cattle, obviously important industry sect uh, in the egg, uh, egg industry here in North Dakota. You know, both you and I noticed uh, you and Senator Holvin uh, joined a bicameral uh, group of members of Congress uh, in writing a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland, urging him to continue uh, the in, uh, investigating uh, suspected price manipulation in the cattle market. Um, I know you're learned in the law and uh, rooted in the judicial system. Kelly, maybe you, could you lay out the context a little bit about what's what's kind of driving that and then maybe an update on where the investigation is at from your perspective and your knowledge? Well, I can give you the update first. It's going slowly. And uh, I think that's one of the problems with when people talk about antitrust or competition factors in the marketplace. They, uh, there's two different sides to antitrust, right? And an enforcement of antitrust is an executive branch function. It's USDA, DOJ, those types of investigations. They're very long, they're very slow. You know, chicken, uh, there was just a ruling on, on poultry about six months ago. And that was, I think, I, the administration was that. But there are things we can do from the antitrust side in the legislative space. And that's where I think um, what's going on in that. The House today is going to probably vote on H.R. 5609, which is the Cattle Contract Library Act. And that's a way to increase transparency and things in the marketplace. Um, it's not a silver bullet. Uh, we know this. The four companies that essentially um, deal with the middleman portion of that. But we've been pretty critical of the both administrations on Brazil um, and, and importations and dealing with some of those issues. But I mean, it, there are things we can do. The bill authorizes USDA to issue grants to universities and associations who can work directly with producers to disseminate and analyze the information. You know, it's egg's not unique to this. The market is just bigger all the time. And if you can analyze data in real time, you're gonna have the best opportunity to compete in the marketplace. So we're gonna continue to push forward with those targeted pieces of legislation and also put pressure on the administration, whoever it may be, to robustly enforce antitrust and allow for our producers to get their products to market in the most competitive way possible. Excellent, thank you. Great, uh, great answer and a timely update. Uh, I guess some progress is better than none, uh, and I know you'll be uh, keeping keeping your uh, keeping the fire underneath their feet. Well, I will tell you, I think this investigation. The problem with this, right? And it doesn't matter if it's cattle or poultry or pork or all of these different issues. Um, it probably should have started a long time ago. And the reason that matters is because it takes a long time to do it. And it's just, it's so we want, we don't want to wait for the, it, for the enforcement investigation to get done. There are still things we can do in the competition space that we can do in Congress that isn't picking winners and losers, but also is allowing smaller producers to have more access to more places. Got it. Makes sense. Well, on to another uh, area of interest uh, in the egg uh, industry. Uh, for you know, for many years, uh, there's been a discussion about the balance between independent family farms and larger corporate farming interests, uh, and how the two can coexist. And I know this is something that you and Senator Holvin have obviously uh, very familiar with from your roles uh, in a previous life in state government. Um, what actions can and should Congress take to ensure our family farms remain the backbone of feeding our nation, while also recognizing the important role for these larger business interests? I think the first and foremost, particularly with the increase in technology, is one of the things that I'm always fascinated with is I think people have a very interesting misconception of what a family farm is. And some of that's the economies of scale, right? I mean, we and, and the amount that needs to do it. But also, I think it's the... I think our egg producers are some of the most technolo technologically advanced businessmen and women in the world. And so by being able to maintain core farm markets and foreign market development program, that's how we help um, family farms um, maintain competitive. And allowing that access to smaller organizations as a whole is important. 
And the reason I say that is because that's the one place where larger corporations can really maximize their advantage in that you can have entire members of your staff deploy just to that. Whereas if you're a small family farm operation, you're doing everything, right? So allowing for that, allowing for those services to be able to allow smaller people access to those markets is, and, and compete on, if not an even playing field, but being able to play in the same sport at least is a real way where we can continue to do that. And, you know, North Dakota is unique in that our relationship and our proximity to Canada allows us to do some of those things, but we feed and feel the world. And if we have a fair shot at the marketplace, I think we compete with anybody. The difference for smaller operations versus larger operations is our smaller operations are definitely a jack of all trades and we need to be able to have those resources available. And I think North Dakota does a pretty good job of that, but we can always do better. Well, and, and on the markets uh, that you bring it up, actually, our next question, uh, you know, was on that uh, topic. Can you talk a little bit about what Congress has done or what should be done to expand market opportunities for our egg producers? You know, for instance, have programs like the Farmers Market Promotion Program been helpful in strengthening local and regional food systems? Uh, you know, encouraging empowering growth and development of small meat processors, I think, is a good example. Understanding, listen, a lot of people who don't come from ag producing districts don't recognize that this isn't truly a free market and it hasn't been truly a free market for a long time. And that's through various trade agreements. I think USMCA was a huge help. It was a tremendous upgrade in the grain grading system alone for our, for, to deal with our neighbors to the North was really important. But I think, you know, and we've been dealing with a lot of that pre COVID that was probably the pre COVID pre drought the single biggest thing we did in our office regarding some of that stuff is um, how implementation of some of the USMCA policies have done. And then I think also one of the things we really have to be conscious of, even with our friends and allies, is the protectionism that comes in with uh, you know different chemicals, different things that uh, we know to be safe, we know to be, um, um, pro I mean, how we, how we do our egg production, but in a quest to protect their own, um, their own interests, some of even our trading partners will over enforce some of those things. And so being able to make sure that the trade agreements are being followed according to, if not the spirit of the law and the implementation and regulation is always really important. Got it, got it. And I mean, while we're here, just to pause, I know we've obviously had a, a change in the administration and that brings along changing policies philosophically uh, and the like. Uh, no, with North Dakota farmers, you know, there was, uh, uh, obviously, an interesting time uh, with uh, uh, then President Trump uh, in uh, China. You know, uh, putting the uh, putting the screws to uh, to China on this. A any thoughts on uh, how the new administration uh, is engaging on this, and uh, from an agricultural perspective? Yeah, and I, I well, so I, I was really. I mean, that was an issue. That obviously, that came up a lot, and a lot of the commodity groups, and that came up not only the last election but the election before, right? Um, I don't think at this point in time um, that it's a real viable argument to say that China isn't our largest strategic adversary in the world moving forward in the 21st century. Um, from building coal plants to all of the different issues they're doing to capitalize on some different things. Uh, at the same time, we want to sell them our soybeans. <laughs> and we do. So we have to have that tension in place. But I will tell you, uh, talking to our egg producers across the state, over the last three years being a member of Congress, they recognize the challenges and potential dangers China China proposes to the, I mean, to, the, to freedom, democracy, capitalism in the world, but also at the same time, we wanna be able to do that. And so um, I think moving forward and how we do that, we wanna be able to hold them accountable on things that they are available to, but we also wanna be able to make sure that the world's second largest economy is capable of, purchasing the things we deal we just want a fair we want fair deals we don't want to be held i i mean over a barrel because of computer chips or whatever else um there was no secret that the one of the reasons china put tariffs on soybeans was because it hurt um the former administration in districts that voted for him the most and so we have to continue to deal with that we also have to recognize that this is one part of a very large global global conversation regarding China and their expansion. And so we have to be able to do it smart. We have to be able to deal with it. And then the other answer is 
if we are going to hold them accountable, whether it's in the egg sector or anywhere else, we have to provide appropriate off ramps for the businesses and the industries that have relied on that for a very long time. Because we have, we, you can't change the rules of the game immediately and then expect everybody to, uh, do, for the economy to react in that, in that semblance of a time period. Well, thank you, Congressman. And uh, I think maybe we'll give you a, uh, a break for just a second, get your breath. I think we've been joined with uh, North Dakota Senior Senator John Hoven. Uh, Senator, are you with us? The I smart am. part of this is about to start. <laughs> I was learning a lot listening to Kelly. I thought we should just keep going. Oh, great to be with you. Thanks for inviting me and happy to uh, join in on this uh, ag policy discussion wherever and however you think works best, Brian. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great to see you again, Senator. Uh, appreciate you uh, squeezing us in. Know how busy, know this is a very busy time of the year out there. Do a brief introduction uh, for, uh, uh, I don't know, the two people that might not be familiar with Senator Hovind's long and storied uh, track record uh, in our audience today. But uh, as many of you know, in 2010, Senator Hovind was elected to the U.S. Uh, Senate. Prior to his election to the Senate, he served as governor of North Dakota for uh, just nearly over a decade. Uh, in the Senate, Senator Hovind serves on the Senate Agriculture Committee, the Appropriations Committee, Energy and Natural Resources Committee, as well as the Committee on Indian Affairs. So with that, Senator uh, Kelly and I have warmed up the audience for you. Kelly definitely did the heavy lifting on that. Uh, feel free to take uh, a few moments uh, for some opening comments. Well, I appreciate being with you and greetings to all your members that are joining us today. Good to be here with Kelly. And I know that Senator Klobuchar addressed you uh, through uh, uh, video, I think, uh, either earlier or is going to do so later. She and I have had the opportunity to address you uh, together uh, in previous in a previous session, and that was very enjoyable uh, because we could kind of go back and forth and talk about some of the things that we're working on together. So really enjoyed that. Uh, I know schedule-wise it didn't work this year, but that's a great format and it's fun to do. But good to be with you, obviously, agriculture uh, for us, for me, and for my office is number one. Ag is number one in North Dakota. We've been an ag powerhouse forever, and we just continue, uh, or our farmers and ranchers continue to do what they do better than anyone in the world, and that's uh, provide the uh, highest quality, lowest cost food supply that every single American benefits from every single day. And so it, it really is a, you know, an honor for me to try to work to help our farmers and ranchers do just that. And so typically I like to start and, and usually end by uh, saying that very emphatically. I know uh, all our North Dakota friends uh, know how th that that is true, but you know, in a lot of places around this country, particularly the big cities, they think food comes from the grocery store. So I like to remind them the importance of farm policy isn't just about our farmers and ranchers. It benefits every single one of them every single day. And we can't take that for granted. And I think understanding that then uh, helps create real support uh, for good uh, ag policy, good farm policy, particularly when you know we become such an urbanized uh, society. So I always like to start with that. Uh, beyond that, you know we're a huge energy powerhouse state now too. That's a huge industry. Uh, we're doing great things in technology and and many other areas. But you know ag ag really is our base and always will be. And of course, what's more important than a uh, you know a sound food supply? in terms of the security of our nation, as well as the well-being uh, of uh, all Americans. So I'll start there and then we can get into any aspect that you wanna talk about, whether it's farm bill or crop insurance or what we're trying to do for our cattlemen or anything else. No, that's great. And uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, appreciate uh, appreciate the great comments. Uh, you know, uh, we, Congressman Armstrong helped kind of give a little bit of a primer to the audience uh, about kind of the farm bill, you know, was reauthorized uh, in, in 2018. Obviously, we're halfway through and in 2023, we're doing there. Um, we're, are there things that you're uh, aspirationally hoping to get included in uh, the 2023 reauthorization? Uh, that didn't maybe make it uh, last time around? And are there any things that you're hoping would be omitted uh, from, uh, from the reauthorization? Sure, you know, there's gonna be any number of things on both that I wanna add and that, you know, I would like to improve or, or some things that I would not want in there. But, you know, again, it, I look at it in terms of all the legislation we work on has to be farmer friendly. And that's certainly true of the farm bill. And so, you know, crop insurance is the number one risk management tool. Uh, our 
uh, farmers tell us that every single year. We want to continue to make sure that it works as well as possible. We're going to continue to work uh, to improve that. The whole underlying concept of the Farm Bill is that it's a counter-cyclical safety net. So whether you use ARC coverage or PLC coverage, we want to make sure both of those products work as well as possible. And remember, in North Dakota, we're very diversified. We're, we're one of the most diverse ag states in the country. Uh, when you look at all the different crops we grow, the animals we raise, you know, some states are just corn and soybeans, and that's kind of it. Uh, mm -hmm. But we lead the nation in probably 14 or more different commodities in terms of our production, ranging from things as diverse as hard red spring wheat to honey and many other uh, crops and, and, of course, livestock in between. So that farm bill has to take that into account. We have to make sure that as we craft these programs, whether it's, like I said, the countercyclical safety net, uh, the uh, crop insurance, or even things like the, the conservation programs, they have to be farmer friendly. The simpler generally uh, is the better. And we're constantly working uh, to do that, as well as protecting private property rights. I always get worried about a big federal government that wants to make sure that, you know, uh, everybody has to do everything the same way. And that doesn't work. I mean, our geography is different. Our diversity in terms of agriculture means that we've got to have some flexibility and make sure that, again, that the farm bill works for farmers and ranchers, not the other way around. That's great. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, and maybe moving, uh, Congressman Armstrong just bookmarked it uh, in, in some of his opening comments. So get the dialogue going with, with the both of you. Uh, but something, something that I know that every North Dakota policymaker understands, as long as I've been coming to the state uh, for a long time, this has been a, a drumbeat that's been going. And it's something particularly of interest uh, to the folks uh, at the chamber uh, here today. And that's workforce issues. Um, obviously, all sorts of industries are struggling across uh, the United States uh, with uh, maintaining a strong workforce. Uh, North Dakota, obviously, being a very competitive market uh, for jobs with the diversification of the industries and, and impacts of the pandemic and all that kind of stuff. What, what has Congress done up to this point and what more could it be doing to really help bolster and strengthen that workforce, particularly in, in, for our friends in the egg business? Are you asking me or is that one for Kelly? First? I, uh, either uh, Senator Hovind, go ahead uh, since uh, you just joined us and then uh, love to hear some of Kelly's thoughts too. Well, it goes back to what I just said on behalf of farmers and ranchers, make sure that you're providing, you know, don't do this one size fits all. Um, right now, the federal government is doing too much taxing, too much regulation and too much spending. They're also doing too much mandating. And uh, we've got to get back to empowering people and empowering businesses. And that means uh, you know, uh, regula uh, less regulation and an approach where it, you know, it helps people do business, make investments, do those kind of things. Um, again, lower taxes, not higher taxes, too much spending that's causing inflation. We've got to reverse course on those things and get back to the kind of approach that we had with the last administration, which helps empower businesses and help empower people. And you, what you saw is a growing economy and rising wages and a supply chain that worked. And because the federal government now is trying to take on too many things and do too, do too many things, overreaching, for example, with these vaccine mandates. Now, again, uh, I've been vaccinated. I've even had the booster shot. But that's a decision uh, that, the, uh, that people should be able to make in, uh, in consultation with their health care providers. And in fact, we're going to have a, a Congressional Review Act vote here in the Senate, uh, which would actually uh, be a vote to overturn that um, that mandate by the administration. And you're, what you're going to see is between Congress and the courts that will be overturned. And this does go back to your question because you've got situations where people, you know, in essence, are are not able to continue to work if they're not conforming with some of these mandates that the federal government is trying to put forward. So we, we've got to get government out of the way in, in these cases, create incentives, you know, for people to come back to work. Same thing with this huge tax and spend bill that the administration and our colleagues across the aisle are trying to push. Again, that creates disincentive to work at a time when we need incentives to work. And those are the things also as we get people back to work that will help us address the supply chain issues and, and hopefully get on top and reduce this uh, problem that we have with inflation. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks, Senator Kelly. Uh, anything to add to, to, no. to John's comments? 
I agree with everything the senator just said. And I also think there's another thing that would be significantly simp or simpler that they could do tomorrow. Open back up. Um, just open back up. If you think there's real consequences, if there's not real consequences to having consulates shut down and different people not in the office, there are some of these things you simply cannot do virtually. And the actual lack of workforce has delayed whether it's getting somebody uh, a temporary permit, you know, a, a custom combiner from South Africa who's been here for nine years in a row with the same egg producer can't get here this year. And it's not because the policy changed, it's because the consulate's not open. Like legitimately getting people back in there and doing that stuff um, would, 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 would not solve anything, but it would at least get us started back on the road again. Yeah, and Ryan, let me add one other thing along that line. Uh, for example, John Bozeman, who's ranking on the Ag Authorizing, I'm ranking on the Ag Probe side, we, we uh, put together a letter that we sent to uh, Secretary Vilsack and basically saying, hey, look, don't be mandating that, for example, in the FSA offices, that uh, people have to have that vaccine or they can't come into work. We need those FSA workers who are working very hard on behalf of our farmer ranchers in those offices as our farmers and ranchers go in and get their year end work done and then uh, try to set up operations for next year. So that's another example of where the government is actually creating uh, these problems of getting people back to work rather than helping us get people back to work. Good, no, well, thank you both uh, for those additional additional thoughts. We've already, Kelly already touched on uh, some of the uh, issues caused uh, recently by some of the droughts. And, and now wanted to move, uh, you kind of got it all in North Dakota. Now uh, with some of the flooding issues, that's been a, a constant problem uh, and ebbs and flows. You know, we understand that, you know, in the $1.1 trillion uh, package, uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill had some substantial dollars devoted uh, to help flood mitigation projects. Um, what are you guys doing to help ensure that North Dakota receives uh, some of that critical funding for these projects, such as the Red River Valley uh, Permanent Flood Protection and the Minot Region Flood Protection Projects? Well, since this is the Fargo, West Fargo, Moorhead Chamber that we're talking to today, I think I'll start with the Red River Valley Flood Wise Protection. Choice. Yes, yes. And it's, it, this is an amazing, this is a model for the nation. And you know the Fargo Greater Metro, I, I think, is one of the most dynamic small metropolitan areas in the country. Doing so many exciting, amazing things, growing like crazy, very bright future. Uh, you know, for for just so many reasons. But obviously, this flood protection is vital for the region. And this is a multi-state project. It's a P3 project. This really is going to be the paradigm for the future because it enables the Corps of Engineers to build these projects with a with a smaller federal investment on an expedited timeline and, and we are the, the beta site we are the model for doing this so it, it's so exciting the federal contribution to the effort it's a 3.2 billion dollar multi-state project all in not only covering the the uh, urban area but the you know the rural area surrounding of that 3.2 billion 750 million is the federal commitment we've already secured over 300 million of that and so what we're doing right now is we're working with the Corps of Engineers I just had a call with uh General Spellman, who's the commander of the, of the Corps of Engineers. And we have now worked to, to secure uh, a support from the Corps of Engineers for funding out of uh, that infrastructure funding that would supplement the regular Corps work plan funding so that we can keep this project on schedule. We need about $180 million this year to keep the course and matching the, the uh, private partner end. And you know we're, we're on a six year timeline to get this done. Our next stop is at the uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army, Mike O'Connor, who we helped myself and A.B. Klobuchar actually went down and helped expedite uh, his confirmation. And so we have a very good relationship with him. And then we'll be going to uh, OMB, uh, both to see if we can't get included in the budget, but then also to make sure that out of that infrastructure funding, uh, we work to include money for flood projects in there and, and the, some of that funding as well goes not only to the Red River Valley Flood Protection Project, but also to Minot. So I don't know if there's any Minot listeners, but all the things I just said about the, the Red River Valley Flood Protection Project, those apply to the Minot region. And again, that's about a $1.2 plus billion all-in project for the whole region all the way from uh, Burlington on the Northwest to uh, Valve on the Southeast. So it's the, the Minot area, but both of those projects then we're working to include. Excellent, excellent. Congressman? 
I just do whatever Senator Hoven tells me to do. Uh, no, right. I, so Senator, the next time, uh, the next time Kelly gets some of his own ideas, you have this no, recording to come back to. Kelly, Kelly what has I, really good ideas, and he, the, I, he, he's great to work with. I mean, it's just really super to have him in the house. I think one of the reasons this has been so successful is because we've obviously had um, our federal delegation and Senator Hoven working on this project essentially nonstop since it happened and since he's been here. And then also I'll just give a shout out in case there's any state legislators on, uh, on the call or on the Zoom. Uh, there was a lot of work done by a lot of people in the North Dakota legislature to help set this up, to put ourselves in a position where we made it as easy as possible on Senator Hoven from the buy-in from the state side in doing that. And I, I can just tell you, somebody only got here in 2018, I joke, but a lot of the heavy lifting was done before we ever got here. And so now it's just a matter of being focused and making sure the implementation moves forward. And so a lot of people have worked really hard on this for a very long time. And I think front and center in that is Senator Hoven and his office and his staff since the day it started. So it really, it's it's a fun thing to come into later, Ryan, and why it's starting to really come to fruition. And I would love to take more credit for it than I can, than I than I'm able to. But I just really seriously work as hard as I can to help all that legwork that's been done help that we implement it properly. Well, it's yeah, and Kelly's right. Yeah. Kelly's right to give a shout out to those state legislators. If there's any on here, way to go. Tremendous job supporting this uh, whole effort in, in both, not only Minot, uh, or I mean, uh, not only in the Fargo region, but in the Minot region and across the state. Big kudos to those, that, that whole crew. No, and I, and I couldn't agree more, Senator. I think this, uh, you know, as this uh, gets project gets completed uh, and keeps the task, it, it just a national model of uh, public and private and all the different units of government coming together. So a, a true, uh, a, a true accomplishment. Uh, love that. Uh, maybe one, one last question as we're getting some of our other panelists uh, ready to go. Um, and, uh, you know, as you, you guys know, the ebb and flow out there, Congress uh, has uh, historically been slow to pass legislation uh, with the run up to midterm elections. So to that end, what do you see as the top priorities for Congress coming up in 2022? And how would you handicap the chances of some of those priorities uh, coming to fruition? Well, uh, one of the things that particularly relates to ag that I would throw out there is that we did work to secure about $10 billion to help with the drought. And there's two components to that, about $750 million of that is for livestock, and then uh, $9.25 billion is for farmers. We tried to use existing programs, in the case of the farmers, the WIP Plus program. In the case of uh, the livestock piece, it would follow the livestock forage program, LFP, and some kind of top up. And we purposely did that to try to expedite it. So what I'm working on right now, uh, again, is trying to get USDA to get that out to our producers as soon as we can, and certainly to get the uh, parameters out so that uh, particularly for the livestock guys who's ha who've had a tough time with the drought, as well as farmers who've had trouble, they know what's coming so they can get in and finish up their year end for this year and then set up their uh, plans and their operating lines for next year. And in the case of the cattle guys, this is really important so that they don't continue, have to continue to sell off their herd, but they can keep that core herd for uh, the future. So in ag world, that's certainly one of the priorities I'm, I'm working on right now. Great, absolutely. Uh, Representative Armstrong, we'll let you have the last word. I would say the one thing I'd like to see done in 2022, which I think everybody in the, um, in the, in the space, and I think it matters to ag producers in rural communities as well, is getting some of these telehealth uh, restrictions permanent, our rollbacks. Uh, it's one of the shining things that has actually worked pretty well over the last two years uh, during COVID. And it, uh, if when the emergency order goes away, everything rolls back to the way it was. And we don't want that to happen because we actually have figured out how to do some of those things. And I think that's something we actually can get done even in an election year. And it's important to every one of our rural communities and it has, it has helped a lot of people out over the last two years and we should continue to keep that going forward. Well, gentlemen, thank you to you both. Uh, a special thanks uh, first and foremost for, for making the panel here today. Uh, I know how, again, how jam packed uh, things are here as we lead up to, uh, lead up to the, the end of the year. Also wanted to just give a special thanks. Uh, it, you guys are great and leadership starts at the top, but working with your combined staffs 
uh, it, where a lot of the real work gets done has been amazing. Uh, just last week, uh, we were out in Washington, D.C. with the delegation from the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber. Uh, it was a phenomenal trip, and I know the members uh, were exuberant, and uh, your staff was very gracious uh, with providing some of the updates. So keep up the wonderful work. We're very lucky to have you. We understand how tough these jobs are, at least from the outside looking in, uh, and uh, we're always here uh, if you need us as a resource uh, or any, uh, any, anything otherwise. So thank you again for, for joining us, both of you. Ryan, thanks to you. Thanks, Shannon, and, and everybody at the chamber there. You guys do a fabulous job. We love working with you. Great uh, to be on here with Kelly. And a big greetings to Senator Smith, who is uh, warming up in the bullpen. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Representative Ka Armstrong. Thank you, <laughs> Good to I see you, Tim. That. Happy to turn it over to you. I'll see, I'll see you in uh, committee in half an hour. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Well, uh, thank you. Well, we've got our next panelist here all queued up. Uh, Senator Smith, Senator Kramer, great to uh, see you virtually. And uh, thank you for joining us. Know all, we know the busy schedules uh, are going on. Uh, great to see you. A warm welcome. Hi, Ryan. Good to see you. Good to be with you. Hi, Tina. Hi, Kevin. Well, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and jump right in. Lots of action-packed things that we'll be discussing in the area uh, of energy policy, and I'm sure a few other things that may come up from time to time. We'll uh, kick it off with uh, Senator Smith first. I'll do a brief uh, brief introduction of, of the Senator. Uh, and before coming to the Senate, uh, Tina, uh, in 2018, when she was elected, uh, before, prior to that, served as Minnesota's Lieutenant Governor under then Governor Mark Dayton. Uh, after previously serving as uh, Dayton's Chief of Staff, she also served as Chief of Staff to Minneapolis Mayor R.T. Ryback. And I'd love to uh, give a warm Fargo-Moorhead, West Fargo Chamber welcome uh, to Senator Smith. And Tina, go ahead, take it away with some opening comments. Love to hear All right. your thoughts. Well, thanks. Thanks so much, Ryan. And thanks to um, everybody at Primacy for organizing this. Thanks to uh, the Chamber. It's great to be with you. And um, I just, it just so happens that today, you know, every day you've got to figure out what face masks to wear. And it just so happens that today I am wearing my Moorhead, More to Love 56560 face mask. So there you have it. <laughs> Um, and um, Senator Kramer, it's great to be with you as well doing this, uh, doing this, um, uh, doing this forum. You know, uh, Kevin and I have been partners on, uh, on, on a few things together, including the work that we've done to try to make insulin more affordable, and um, also uh, good work that we've done related to the topic of today's conversation, which is around carbon supporting carbon capture and storage. So I'm really, I'm, I'm glad to be with my fellow um, Midwesterner and upper Midwesterner. And uh, as I say, when we, when, we take our, when we take the bus back and forth to the upper Midwest, it's sort of like the school bus. So Kevin and I ride the school bus together often as we're, as we're heading home on, on Thursday. So um, our topic for the next few minutes is gonna be around energy policy, a great, a great uh, thing to have a conversation about and an issue of such importance in the upper Midwest where we all live. Um, and you know, I start from the place that a clean energy future is gonna happen in this country and in the world. And the question is whether we in the upper Midwest, um, in Minnesota and North Dakota and in the United States, whether we're gonna lead that transition or whether we're gonna follow. And my strong view is that if we lead, we are going to be on the cutting edge of technology and innovation um, and job creation and uh, also be able to take bold action on the climate crisis, which is gonna be so important for our health um, and for saving money. So it's a great conversation to us, uh, for us to be having, uh, particularly because our region is such a hotbed, literally, of renewable energy and um, clean energy. We are, um, uh, we, we have so much potential and also so much um, untapped potential for us to go after. Um, this is about putting people in good paying jobs. This is about lower energy prices and it's about growing our energy independence with um, clean uh, rural energy. You know, I, I know that you just had a chance to talk a little bit about um, ag issues and I'm, I suspect that this came up um, either with through Senator Klobuchar or with um, Senator Hoven. But I wanna just take a minute here to emphasize the importance of biofuels as we talk about um, um, energy policy. You know, biofuels are about lower prices for gasoline and they're about reducing greenhouse gas emissions and they're about creating opportunity in rural communities across, um, uh, across the upper Midwest. 
And I don't think that we pay enough attention to the role that biofuels can play as we think about the direction that we need to go. Certainly, I'm speaking about ethanol, but I'm also thinking about advanced biofuels um, and biodiesel. Um, I don't know about any of you, but um, I believe that as, as, as we move forward, um, I'm probably not going to be getting on an airplane that is fueled by a battery, but I can imagine getting on an airplane that is few, uh, fueled uh, with, uh, with biofuel jet fuel. And that's the kind of opportunity that we need to seize um, here in the upper Midwest. Um, let me just because I want to get to the questions. I think it's so much more interesting to have a, you know, have a question than just uh, you know, us talking about this. Um, but I want to just note that as we think about um, renewables and clean energy in our part of the world, that, that, that when, as we think about expanding biofuels, wind, solar, we also have to remember the role of carbon capture in our energy uh, portfolio. This is something that um, Kevin and I have worked on together. Senator Hoven and I have worked on together. I mean, it's gonna be incredibly important for the industrial sector in uh, Minnesota and North Dakota, including um, ethanol plants. Uh, and uh, it's just gonna be a huge opportunity for us. So I'm working really hard to make sure that uh, uh, as we wrap up the Build Back Better bill, uh, which will include significant uh, tax credits for clean energy, for advanced nuclear, that it also includes strong, uh, it includes um, strong language for carbon capture as well, because I believe that that needs to be part of the portfolio that we're working on. And at the end of the day, this is about energy resilience, this is about energy reliability, and it's about lower costs, lower costs for fuel, all of which we can accomplish as we move towards this clean energy future. Um, as I said, I think this holds um, huge opportunities for those of us who live and work and are building the economy in the upper Midwest. And um, I'm excited to have this conversation today. So thanks a lot. Well, uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, great opening comments, and we will definitely be coming back. I think that was a great way to frame it. We'll definitely be coming back there. And, I, and it is. It is refreshing. I know uh, last year when we had this conversation, I, I know the news media, uh, whichever slant uh, you might be uh, with, it's not sexy to cover bipartisan cooperation. And I think the, the work that, that you and Senator Kramer and others are doing on the carbon capture piece um, shows that regardless of, listen, people have different opinions, they come from different perspectives, but you know, come together for practical solutions uh, that benefit both you know, uh, folks who are consuming the energy and, and people are producing it uh, is just a textbook case. So really applaud that. No, it doesn't get the kind of coverage that it deserves, uh, but know that people, uh, it, particularly here in the private sector, are paying attention, uh, appreciate it, and are taking our cues from, from your guys' leadership uh, when you come together like that. So uh, thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Kramer, I'll do a brief, uh, brief intro and let you get off to the races here. Uh, Senator Kramer was elected to the United States Senate in 2018 after serving three terms as North Dakota's at-large member of Congress uh, in, uh, in the United States House of Representatives. In 2003, he was appointed by uh, our previous guest, then Governor uh, John Hoven, out of the state's Public Service Commission uh, before being elected to the position again in 2004. Senator Kramer, great to have you with us. Uh, your floor is yours. Thanks, Ryan, and, and to all the members uh, of the chamber, and of course to to Tina for uh, for participating. This is this is as it should be. I wish we could provide more examples, actually, of this kind of conversation that takes place a lot throughout the halls uh, and in the cloakrooms and uh, and uh, in the committee meetings and hearings throughout uh, throughout Congress. It's just to, to your point, it's not very sexy, and so we don't make the six o'clock news. That's okay. Um, I'd rather quietly get things done than loudly um, disrupt them. Uh, but both are important from time to time. Um, obviously, uh, for reasons that are, that are obvious, uh, North Dakota is, is a leader. It's a leader in um, energy production and a leader in agriculture and food pr uh, production and, and, and supply. And of course, important to America's prosperity as, is, as are our neighboring states in Minnesota, South Dakota and the, the great upper Midwest. We are, as you know, one of the largest oil producers in the country as a state. Uh, sometimes we're second, sometimes we're third. Um, we have significant lignite reserves, as Tina has pointed to, uh, that provide reliable electricity and 39.3 million acres of our, uh, of our state are occupied by farms and ranchers, making us a leader in the production of, of several different commodities. Energy policy, of course, has been sort of central in the debate in that 117th Congress. And I know we're gonna discuss it even more here in a little bit, but 
I believe, Ryan, I've always believed Americans want Congress and all of our leaders to address the clear issues that we're facing. Uh, I think most people would be pleasantly surprised, as I said earlier, by how much bipartisan agreement there actually is in Congress. And Tina talked about one of the, the key areas. And by the way, areas that might not be obvious. You know, people might look at something like uh, carbon capture utilization and storage tax credit amendment that, that um, Senator Smith and Senator Capito have, uh, have put out together that John and I and others are part of. Um, and they might say, well, that seems like an unusual thing for all of them to to be part of it. The reality is that we're all part of the same solution. It's not, not every solution gets to the same goal and not every goal requires the same solution. But, but when you're honest, intellectually honest, like Tina is, like I am, like many of our colleagues are, uh, you, you, you take a shot at lots of things, lots of, lots of technologies and innovations. And this is one of them. Uh, North Dakota, as I said, has vastly net reserves uh, and, and the power that we generate is obviously often frequently consumed by Minnesotans. Um, as you said in the introduction, I spent nearly 10 years as a, as a uh, energy regulator, an economic regulator, as well as an environmental regulator. And, uh, and I know the topic and I know that transmission lines that uh, traverse our two states and throughout the Midwest very well. And, uh, and it's a big part of what's prepared me for this job. But Senator Smith's bill would grow the appropriate incentives for carbon capture technology on our coal fleet and natural gas plants and ethanol plants. So I'm glad that Tina brought up biofuels because biofuels are fuels. They are somewhat carbon intensive and there's opportunity in the carbon capture utilization and storage world for, um, for those biofuels. In fact, I would submit to you, and again, we can talk more about it here in a little bit, but that really, Ethanol production is probably one of the areas that's best prepared to take advantage of carbon capture um, technologies and then and store it in caverns and, and underground throughout the Midwest. It saves jobs, it reduces emissions, maintains lo important local tax bases, and provides reliable energy. Something of particular importance heading into the winter in our part of the in our part of the world. It makes sense for North Dakotans and it makes sense for Minnesotans. Republican or Democrat, Republican and Democrat, or anything in between, I'm honored to be able to co-sponsor it. And I'm sure Senator Smith agrees that we should pass it. Um, both Senator Smith and I supported the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, another important bipartisan piece of legislation that empowers our states to invest in the backlog of roads, bridges, and waterway projects. Uh, our states fall in the center, of course, of the, the North American continent and are highly dependent on the ability, our ability to export food and fiber and fuel and, and many other things that we produce. It's, it's not possible without a modern infrastructure system. North Dakota will see roughly a 50% increase in annual funding for highway projects because of this bill. Um, the bill also contains significant permitting reform so that projects are not stuck in the endless environmental reviews. And, and one issue that's often overlooked is the bill includes a provision to expedite permitting of gathering lines on federal and tribal land. Re really important point. I think a lot of people miss this one, um, but it, it, it expedites the permitting of gathering lines. That's for natural gas. So uh, really important to capture that methane. It's a commodity that has value rather than just flaring it into the atmosphere. Similar to the 45Q, um, this provision is a win-win. The producers will not be wasting the marketplace product and the environment will be better off because of it. Unfortunately, where we agree is often, as I said, overshadowed by the partisan overhauls. And I wish we'd focus more on where we agree on legislation that we pass. And it's, it's, uh, it's long lasting that people that we serve aren't stuck in this political ping pong all the time. But even worse, when Congress is gridlocked, it frequently leads to a hyperactive executive branch, which leads to regulatory whiplash. And I think therein lies the, the challenge that Tina and I and, and our colleagues have in providing more prescriptive regulatory um, authorities and re regulatory solutions rather than letting the bureaucracy rewrite it at their whim and ping pong between administrations and, and executive branches. Anyway, um, there are a number of other bills. You know, in fact, in, in, the, uh, in the highway bill, the, the infrastructure package, I mean, um, there was an important legislation that I co-authored with uh, Senator Ben Ray Lujan, a, a Democrat from um, New Mexico. Ben Ray and I served on the Energy and Commerce Committee in the House of Representatives. And that was a legislation that came from North Dakota uh, when uh, Governor Burgum and the Industrial Commission took some of the CARES Act dollars, 
put oil workers to work reclaiming abandoned and orphaned oil wells. It served as a great example of a way to clean up the environment, keep skilled workers working in the field that, they're, that they work in, and keep people off of the, the unemployment rolls and keep them on the payrolls. And so we took that North Dakota legislation, put it in a federal format, and attached it to this infrastructure package and provide something like you know, over $4 billion on a competitive basis for states like North Dakota and several other states that have a lot of these old, you know, abandoned and, and orphaned wells that, uh, that can be cleaned up and, and keep people working in the field that they're uh, accustomed to working in. So uh, again, I think there are lots of other opportunities. I think we ought to talk about climate. I'm not afraid to talk about climate. I tend to lean into climate. Tina said something really important about what the future could hold for, for, um, for climate change, for cleaning up greenhouse gas emissions, reducing emissions, and that, that the Midwest, North Dakota, Minnesota can, can lead in that area. And I would submit to you, we are. We're doing exactly that. The United States of America has nothing to apologize for, being the number one reducer of greenhouse gas emissions over the course of the last 15 years. And while the United States has reduced its greenhouse gas emissions over those 15 years by 12%, the world, the rest of the world, has increased by 24%. And so um, I, along with a number of my colleagues, are offering up some solutions that include things like the Carbon Capture Utilization and Storage Act and other things, technologies and innovations, as well as geopolitical relationships, trade, trade uh, suggestions, way to ways to bring the polluters of the world more into our realm and our standards rather than us, uh, you know, rather than us simply importing theirs. With that, I'm happy to answer questions and have a discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Senator. Lots to unpack there. Really great comments. And, you know, we just have to say, and we know, uh, listen, this is a tough business you guys are in. It's a full contact sport. Political winds shift uh, from week to week. Uh, but as far as the chamber is uh, concerned, and we I mentioned this in our closing comments with, with Senator Hoven and, and Congressman Armstrong, uh, you know, we were out in Washington, D.C. Uh, with the delegation from the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber, uh, met with your staffs, which were uh, very gracious and very informative. Uh, but we also met with the U.S. Chamber, uh, mm -hmm. who's kind of our, you know, uh, that obviously we're affiliated with. Um, and they couldn't be more effusive of the praise of the bipartisan infrastructure bill that was passed that uh, had been a number one priority of theirs for a multitude of years, as well as uh, a different uh, administrations of different political philosophies. Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce uh, was supportive of the infrastructure bill. So we wanna say thank you. Uh, something you guys don't get to hear enough. So we appreciate it. You know, I hate to be the one over here heralding all the bipartisan cooperation when uh, there's lots of stuff to fight over. But I do think it's important to highlight that. We appreciate both of your uh, votes uh, and the like. I think uh, the Senator, Senator Kramer, hit on some really important things that that infrastructure uh, bill is going to bring home uh, for our region. Senator Smith, obviously want to give you an opportunity, uh, your thoughts. Uh, what was compelling for you and what were you most excited about uh, that was included in uh, that, uh, you know, long uh, process to get that passed? Yeah, well, thank you. And it, um, you know, the, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act was a big deal. Uh, it represents the largest commitment to improving our roads and bridges that we've seen in a generation. And folks that live in northwestern Minnesota and um, and northeastern North Dakota understand that this is an economic issue to make these improvements in our roads and bridges and, and transit too. It's also a safety issue uh, as we wanna make sure that, that uh, as folks are driving on highways and going back and forth to school and to work and as they're getting their products to market that those roads are safe. So that is a really big deal. And I know it's gonna make a huge difference in Minnesota as well as in uh, North Dakota. Um, the, this is not directly related to energy, though it's really related to everything in our economy, is the investment that we are poised to make in broadband. Um, broadband is the basic utility of the 21st century, just like um, electricity was the basic utility that we wanted to connect every household to 100 years ago with uh, rural electrification. So those investments are going to be really huge. But let me just say a little bit about what is in the bipartisan infrastructure bill related to energy, because I think it sometimes gets overlooked in all of the, in the uh, focus on um, you know, the, the roads and bridges infrastructure and broadband. It is going to make um, significant investments um, in energy and energy um, 
efficiency and in transmission. You know, one of the challenges that we have to bringing online the massive solar and wind energy resources that we have in the upper Midwest is a transmission grid that can um, accommodate uh, that um, that renewable energy while it's also making sure that there's reliability for everybody um, all of the time. And that investment is gonna be a really, really big deal. There is some um, funding for residential and commercial energy efficiency. And th this is something that maybe it doesn't seem like as cutting edge as some of the other things like vehicle electrification, but it is a huge deal in terms of um, saving money for consumers and for businesses. And of course, every, um, you know, every kilowatt of energy that you don't use is energy saved and emissions saved. So, and it creates big, big job opportunities for folks as we're doing those, uh, doing those retrofits. So um, those are a few of the things that I think are in the infrastructure bill that are going to make a big difference. I just want to also say that um, it is in the Build Back Better Act that we have the kind of long-term um, investments in bringing energy costs down and expanding um, clean energy, especially with those tax credits. Um, but there's a lot to be proud of in the, um, in the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Well, and Senator Smith, uh, maybe we'll stick with you uh, since you brought up the topic uh, of broadband. Know that this is something that you've been a passionate advocate for uh, for almost as long as I've known you, which is a few years. Um, but uh, know that you uh, you introduced, I know Senator Kramer was an original co-sponsor of the Flexible Financing for Rural America Act. Uh, and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what that do, bill would do to improve the financial stability of electric co-ops uh, and small rural broadband providers who are facing uh, difficulties uh, of a financial nature. Yeah, well, um, Kevin and I both know how important rural electric co-ops are in our states and the importance that they are not only for being um, energy producers, but also for um, connecting, uh, for, you know, for, for the connections that we need to make around broadband. And so it's a really big deal. So this, what we want to do is to, the Flexible Financing for Rural America Act, which I introduced with Senator Hoven actually, um, including Senator um, Kramer as a co-sponsor, would help co-ops by allowing them to refinance their RUS loans um, at lower, the lower rates that we see in place today. So this is um, just a, a good thing to do uh, to help those really, really important institutions. Unfortunately, we weren't able to get that included. It wasn't included in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, but we're going to keep pushing to get that done um, in other ways that we can find. And I, I know Kevin wants to help with that. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, very good. Uh, let's um, yeah, move along here. Uh, Senator Kramer, you, you talked a little bit about uh, greenhouse gases. Uh, throw this out to, to you first. How are greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, regulations being determined and what can uh, the U.S. Senate uh, do to help ensure that those regulations are more helpful than harmful for folks in, in our region? Yeah, wow. You've asked a massive question there, Ryan. And I, I've been working a lot, like I said earlier, with my colleagues on leaning in on that issue. And one of the things that I think one of the things I emphasize a lot, and I think is really important, and I'm trying to get my colleagues to think a lot about it, and that is if, you know, regardless of where you fall on the whose fault is it, how bad is it, I think there's way too much alarmism that centers around it. But the reality is that the American people want and expect us to deal with the issue of greenhouse gas emissions, with the issue of climate change. But it does no good if we transfer our climate guilt to polluting countries. Right now, you know, John Kerry runs around the world and tells our allies in Asia, don't buy natural gas from the United States. We were trying to, we're trying to keep it in the ground. Whatever you do, don't buy energy from us, which means they buy it from Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin's natural gas emits 40% more greenhouse gas emissions than American natural gas put in liquid form and shipped, shipped uh, over to our allies in, in Europe, as an example. I think what we have to do is, this is where Republicans and Democrats, regardless of where you are in the spectrum, need to sit down and talk about these, the, these things in the context of reality. I think what we ought to be doing is we ought to do more permitting reform like we did in the infrastructure bill. There's, there's other permitting reforms in, in, the, in the bipartisan infrastructure bill as well. I think the infrastructure piece for moving more clean energy or energy of all types, um, it, it, Tina's right, is a good idea. We might disagree on how it ought to be paid for. Jennifer Granholm, the Secretary of Energy, and I talked three times during, the, during our negotiations on 
on the infrastructure package, but it's still, it is important how we get there. We may argue about or disagree on, but we need to get there, which is why I voted for the bill. I think recognizing, first of all, that, that the biggest polluters are not the United States. The United States is reducing greenhouse gas emissions. China is increasing them. In fact, China's greenhouse gas emissions are 300% ours, and they're continuing to rise. And we need to have a, a, a standard. I, I, I'm going to, I'm putting out an op-ed here shortly. I don't want to you know, tell you all about it, but uh, I'm going to be putting on an op-ed with a co-author that will get significant attention. And I, I think we need to take a geopolitical look, use our trade leverage as the largest consumer in the world, 20% of the world's economy, and set some standards between the Europeans and the United States that other countries should have to meet. And if those countries don't meet our standards, they ought to pay for that. As opposed to, as opposed to building Nord Stream 2, green lighting Nord Stream 2 after previous presidents have, have uh, um, opposed it, the current president green-lighted it, allowing, again, much dirtier, um, much less uh, efficient Vladimir Putin Russian gas to be fed to our allies and then let them become you know, dependent on his, his uh, dirty fuel, which is a national security risk as well. We need to have this, these honest discussions, but again, I think focus on global, focus on geopolitical, and let the innovators innovate. And that's why things like Tina's bill on carbon capture are so important. Well, Senator, thanks for giving us a little preview. Uh, we will all be waiting with bated breath for the uh, soon to come out op-ed. Senator Smith, yeah, same question on greenhouse regulations and how, how do you strike that, that right balance? Yeah, well, um you know, I've come to I've come to understand that in Minnesota, you don't have to um, you don't have to persuade a farmer that climate change is real. You don't have to persuade a small town mayor that climate change is real when they're trying to figure out how to deal with the additional flooding that their um, wastewater treatment systems are dealing with. I mean, we have been living through a period of extreme droughts and then flooding and then fires that tell us that our climate is changing. People get that and they want to know. Um, you know, what is the action that we're going to take to address this? Um, and so your question is an interesting one, because, you know, my view of it is that we should, whenever possible, be taking legislative action rather than relying on regulatory action. I think that that is more predictable to businesses and to, um, to you know, farmers, because legislative change tends to be, you know, change that holds rather than change that shifts back and forth, depending on who sits in the White House. Um, um, and that's why I think it's so important that we do the kind of work that we're um, wanting to do in the um, Build Back Better Act around supporting these um, clean energy tax credits, which will provide, um, you know, clarity for investors around where they're going to be able to, you know, kind of what the return on investment they're going to get for their um, for their resources. But when it comes to regulation, you know, the purpose of regulation in a very big picture way is it's about protecting our health and it's about protecting our air and our water quality, the kind of the common good. And I think that regulation should be developed in a way that encourage collaboration and working together and that those folks that are closest to the work and to the problem have a good opportunity to be heard. And it should be done as much as possible through incentives um, rather than through enforcement and penalties. Now, I'm not naive. I mean, you need both in order to be able to get done uh, what you need to get done. But I mean, I think the question with a good regulatory strategy is are you trying to get to yes or are you trying to punish somebody who didn't get to yes? And I think we should be looking at ways that we can we can be trying to get to yes. The other thing I'd say, and maybe this is where um, you know Kevin and I um, have some common ground, is that you know we should be thinking about regulations, particularly with regard to greenhouse gases, that that establish some sort of an even playing field, uh, so that um, American businesses and American companies aren't kind of competing, you know, ha have a have a fair competing field. Now, I don't know exactly where Kevin is going to go with his op-ed. I'm very interested, but I mean, this is one of the reasons that I support a, a border adjustment tax, so that American businesses and American-made um, uh, manufactured goods are able to compete on a fair playing field um, as we work to do as we do the hard work of reducing carbon emissions with um, with countries around around the world. And, you know, Kevin is is right that, uh, you know, the United States is, I believe, still the largest emitter of carbon um, um, of, of carbon pollution. Um, China is actually dramatically outpacing us in terms of deployment of renewable energy. And so this is the thing that I'm talking about it when it comes when it comes to how we need to be really leading on this, because as we de are developing our technology around um, around hydrogen, around carbon capture, 
um, around battery storage in particular. This is a place where we can be on the, on the leading edge and that's gonna be creating, um, I hope, American jobs and American manufactured goods with American um, mined and melted and uh, melded um, steel in the United States. Um, that that's what we really need to do for our, uh, for our future. I should say, uh, just I want to be clear, I, I think per capita, the United States is the largest emitter, though I think overall China is the largest emitter um, overall. Well, I uh, can only imagine if we were a fly on the fly on the school bus uh, that you guys go back and forth, the uh, intriguing debates that must happen on there. Thanks for giving us a, a sanitized version of that discussion. I, I know we're coming up to uh, hard stops for committee votes uh, and that kind of stuff. One thing that I uh, wanted to squeeze in, I'd be remiss if we missed it on energy policy uh, and something that average consumers uh, and, and voters uh, and citizens uh, are noticing, obviously there's inflation issues and you're seeing uh, you know, the basic uh, cost of goods uh, and everything else uh, that are increasing. Uh, people are feeling it in their pocketbooks, whether they're watching what's going on in DC or not, they're watching it uh, in their pocketbooks and their daily budgets and none probably more visible than gasoline. Um, what from your perspective, and we'll, uh, I know we've only got a, a few minutes, so if you guys could keep, uh, keep your comments uh, quick and we'll maybe stick with you, uh, Senator Smith, and give uh, Senator Kramer the last word. What more can Congress be doing uh, to, uh, to address this issue uh, that is on a lot of people's minds right now? Well, I'll be really quick so that um, uh, Kevin can close up because I do have to go vote. But um, one, we should be investing in research and development so that we can figure out, you know, be on the, as I just said, on the cutting edge of technology. Um, two, we should be investing in um, energy efficiency because a dollar saved on energy that you didn't use is a dollar saved, and it helps us to get to our greenhouse gas emission goals. Um, and um, you know, that's like, for example, the um, effort that we have on weatherization assistance and the kind of work to really get that energy efficiency. Um, and then I would say also uh, that work that we want to do and we can do on transmission upgrades is going to help us get clean energy into the grid. And remember, clean energy, once you build the infrastructure, it's free. You don't pay for solar or wind once you get it. You just have to get it and then get it distributed. And so that in the long run is going to be a big driver for pushing costs down. Okay. Uh, Senator Kramer. So a couple of things on the, on the gas front. I and mean, first of all, we've got to stop. And, and, and one second, Senator Smith, sorry, I know you've got a, a hard stop. So if you have to vanish into uh, back into the real world, by all means, uh, we didn't want uh, anyone thinking that you were being rude. We know you've got the people <laughs> business of Minnesota to do. I appreciate it. Kevin, it's great to see you. I'll see you on the floor in a few minutes. Yep. Tina's a lot Thanks of things, everyone. but she's not, she's never rude. <laughs> <laughs> see you, see you saying, I might sometimes be wrong, but never rude. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll also tell you, Ryan, you'd be very disappointed if you were fly on the on the wall of the of the Delta uh, school bus because we we talk about normal things like normal people from the Midwest almost never talk about politics or policy. <laughs> Lots to talk about the weather then. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Tina. Um, so with regard to inflation, first of all, inflate, this inflation in the energy sector, of course, is not unique to the energy sector, but gasoline is probably the leading indicator of how bad the inflation is because we see the price right on the big marquees. Um, we know it when we fill our, our car up with gas. Um, it, it's the first thing that, that we can do, and, and that is to legislate to make sure that the administration cannot you know, halt production or transportation via pipelines by shutting pipelines down, by shutting down uh, production on federal lands where some of our richest resources are. Um, you, you know, and, and then begging OPEC for, for help to, to, to uh, produce more of the oil that produces the gasoline and the diesel. It's just absolute folly economic policy. Um, you know, to, to, to cut out the supply and somehow think that the demand was going to come down with it. Um, the reality is we want to increase demand around the world and increase supply. The number one thing, Ryan, we can do to bring gas prices down is produce more oil in the United States of America and refine it into finished product in the United States of America. The next best thing we can do to bring down price is to produce more in the United States of America and export it to our allies around the world. Nobody produces this stuff better and cleaner than we do. We also ought to be able to bring more of our supply chain into the United States. This is what, when I talk about the geopolitics of climate, 
Tina's right. There's a lot of opportunity. Now, she talked about a border adjustment tax. I'm not, I'm not saying that there shouldn't be some mechanism for, for price, but you've got to level the playing field for imports, not for exports, but for imports. And um, this is where I think you've got to have a standard that is universal across al among the allies that, that puts the onus on the polluting countries, not on the clean countries. We shouldn't punish ourselves unilaterally disarm the American economy while pretending that somehow we're not um, contributing because we've, because we've transferred our, our climate guilt to a polluting country. Uh, there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, you know, I, Tina's a great partner. Uh, Amy and John are great partners. Um, John and Mike down in South Dakota are great partners. Uh, we have, we're, we're pretty blessed in our part of the world. Uh, North Dakota nice, Minnesota nice, Montana, okay nice. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a good, it's a good it's a good group and uh, we do travel together Take a that lot games. in Minneapolis and DC <laughs> yeah. yeah no John Tester and, and Steve Danes are great partners as well we all work very well together on a lot of these issues um, and, and by the way and I appreciate you asking her about broadband Amy and I as well as Tina and John have worked really closely on a lot of the broadband issues and there we did get a lot of money in the uh, in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure package for broadband development, because as you know, it, it, when, when Jennifer Granholm called me and said, and asked me the fundamental question, do you think carbon or CO2 pipelines are, are infrastructure? Do you believe electric transmission lines are infrastructure? I said, anything that moves commerce to market, anything that, that assists in the transaction in our free market system is infrastructure. And it is, I think as a result of, of the interstate commerce responsibilities of the federal government, it falls on us to make sure that we have a robust, clean, modern, resilient infrastructure in all of those areas. Tina and I might disagree on, on how to pay for some of that stuff. As an, as an environmental regulator and an economic regulator, I believe the socialization of costs should be borne by the ratepayer, not the taxpayer, but it needs to be borne by somebody and it's important. Well, Senator, thank you so much. Uh, we've got to wrap up for the next exciting panel. Really appreciate you taking time. Good luck out there. I'm also feeling very much in the holiday spirit. I love the peppermint tie. Uh, looking, looking sharp as always. Uh, Senator, we'll catch up with you soon. Uh, good luck out there uh, in the final uh, final weeks here in uh, 2021. Uh, and um, uh, take care. Next, uh, I've got the privilege Merry here. Christmas. Uh, yeah, Merry Christmas to you, sir. Uh, now I get to get out of the hot seat and you guys get a big time upgrade, uh, at least with your moderator, uh, for, uh, Emily Tranter, uh, my team member, uh, who, uh, heads up our Washington DC office, uh, uh, with our team, uh, out there, uh, Emily, uh, you know, she's been working, uh, working with our team out in Washington DC for a great time, St. Paul, Minnesota native, uh, also my hometown. Uh, but has spent time out uh, in North Dakota, has been out in Washington, D.C. for uh, nearly 17 years. Uh, I won't uh, try to put a date on that. Uh, she was very young uh, when she went out there, uh, worked uh, at a variety of places uh, on the Hill, including uh, being a, a staffer for US, then U.S. Senator Mark Dayton. So with that, Emily, great to see you. Uh, and uh, I will sign off and, and good luck uh, with uh, Congresswoman Fishbach. Thank you so much, Ryan. It is wonderful to be with everybody this afternoon. Um, and I'm really excited to moderate uh, this panel and have this discussion with Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach from Minnesota's seventh congressional district. Um, and I will be introducing her in just a moment. Also after that, um, as Ryan mentioned earlier, because the, all of your members are doing the work of the people today, uh, we did have some time shifts. And so Senator Klobuchar's video on infrastructure and policy and her thoughts on that will be shared after we have this great discussion with, with Congresswoman Fishbach. Um, but first I would like to introduce Congresswoman Michelle Fishbach uh, of, of Minnesota's seventh congressional district. She was elected, first elected to serve the district in uh, 2020 in the US House of Representatives. Before that, uh, the Congresswoman was elected to the state Senate in 1996 and served until 2018 when she became the 49th Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota. After then, Lieutenant Governor Tina Smith was appointed to the U.S. Senate. Additionally, Representative Fishbach was the first woman to serve as president of the Minnesota Senate from 2011 to 2013, and then elected again by her colleagues in 2017. She was, uh, and 
she, she then left and became um, Congresswoman for the seventh district. So please help me in welcoming Representative Fishbach. And I will uh, invite you to share a few brief remarks before we jump into some Q&A with, with, with us and look forward to the conversation. All right, well, thank you so much. And, and I'm assuming I didn't get a chance to test the microphone, but I'm assuming since you're not, you can hear me. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity just to say a few words and have this wonderful conversation. Um, but first I do wanna say, uh, Congressman Kelly Armstrong sends his regards. Uh, I know that he wanted to uh, join in with us today, but unfortunately he got it called into a committee meeting that he couldn't miss. So um, so I won't say I speak on his behalf, but I'm simply sending um, greetings from him. And please, if there, if you do have any questions for him, I know he would love you to reach out to his office um, to, to get those questions answered. But, you know, I've been in DC for about 11 months now, and I, I sit on the Ag Committee, the Judiciary Committee, and the Rules Committee. And the schedule has been busy, and uh, you know we're, we're but we are starting to get some in-person meetings um, now that uh, the COVID restrictions are loosening a little bit. And I know that probably even met in person with some of the folks uh, here in DC. That some of the folks on the on the call today, um, you know, recently, and and I just caught the tail end of um, of Senator Smith and Senator Kramer, um, but you know, Congress has been dealing with the infrastructure bill. And uh, and the debt ceiling, the Build Back Better bill, and this week we this week we do have we've been dealing with the debt ceiling. Last night we voted um, to uh, send the procedure, not the actual debt ceiling bill, but a procedure for coming up with the debt ceiling over to the Senate. So they'll be dealing with that. We had the NDAA on the on uh, the floor last night. Um, it was the second time that we voted on it. We had it on the floor and there was a, there was a few uh, um, things that were of great concern, which one of them was uh, the um, uh, women registering for selective services and a red flag portion on, on firearms when that went over to the Senate. So that was all taken out and it was a much better bill coming back. Uh, so it, uh, and it did pass last night. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else that we've been doing the last couple, but we may be actually, we may be back next week. We were supposed to be done on Friday for, uh, for Christmas, but we may be back next week for one day to deal with that debt ceiling, um, depending on how quickly the Senate sends it back and, and if they've changed anything or what's, what's happening with that. So, uh, we may be back for that, but I will just tell you, we've been working hard um, and appreciate all the input from constituents and the opportunity to visit with people across the district. You know, we've hearing about the workforce shortage and and today we had the corn growers in and they're talking about the, uh, um, you know, the inflation and the high prices on fertilizer. So there's a lot of things going on, lots of meetings and really um, looking forward to the conversation, looking forward to hearing what uh, you guys are interested in and um, and. I will just say, and I'll probably say it at the end too, but as always, if there's something that we don't touch that you're interested in, please feel free to give my office a call too. But looking forward to the conversation, Emily. Wonderful, Congresswoman, thank you. Well, and I should just mention before I do ask the first question that um, as you mentioned, your office did meet with a delegation out from the chamber last week. And we just really appreciate that and continue to appreciate your staff's great work and connection uh, with your office. Um, and I know that uh, there was just some great conversations that were had then and we'll continue them today. So we are, um, we've, we thought we would be interesting to talk about, as you mentioned, sort of the topics of the day, which you all have been focusing on, mainly infrastructure, um, I, you mentioned the debt ceiling, but I wanted to just touch on recognizing that you did all, not ultimately support the recently passed infrastructure bill. Now that it's been passed and it's been signed into law, what do you think were some of the good provisions that were included that can help uh, your region and the state? And then if there were some uh, provisions that were particularly troublesome to you, would be interested to hear your, your thoughts on that as well. Well, and I, you know, the infrastructure bill, one of the, there, there is money for roads and bridges in the infrastructure bill. In my opinion, not enough. It was not focused on what, when you think of the word infrastructure, what's actually, you know, what you expect to be in there and that's roads and bridges and, and things like that. And so there was a lot of things. So that was good. That was the good portion of the bill. And the rural broadband expansion, I believe uh, Congress, or Senator Kramer mentioned that. And, you know, I'm absolutely in favor of all those things, like I said, but I don't think there was enough of it. Um, there was a lot of spending on other things, you know, and there's a mileage tax, uh, pilot project in there and even in the in the Minnesota Senate um, that really concerned me because I think it's more difficult for 
uh, it's it's harder on rural areas where you have to drive further. And so I don't think that's a necessarily a fair way to deal with things. You know, there's also subsidies for electric vehicles. There's a, the push for the new Green Deal agenda. And I think a lot of those will be harmful for rural Minnesota and for the ag industry. You know, and uh, there was money for broadband in there in which I, I commend there's money for broadband, although I'm very concerned about that it's actually the money is being used um, in a way that gets broadband to the doors and and actually two people and you know one in five farms in my district does not have broadband service and so we want to make sure that that money is being used wisely we actually um, we in ag committee um, came up with a bill that was bipartisan work on that bill and, on broadband and it passed unanimous, unanimously bipartisanly out of the ag committee and unfortunately the majority chose not to use any of that in the infrastructure bill. And I think there was some very good things in that bill that would have helped uh, help rural areas and making sure that we're getting the broadband where we need to. So in the end, I just, I didn't think there was enough for that, um, for the roads and bridges, although there was some and that will be good for uh, for some, um, but not enough. That's, that's fantastic. And, and so on the roads and bridges piece, I mean, I think a, a two part follow up to that question would be, you know, with all of this spending about to take place and coming down to the state, um, what is Congress and what what can um, local jurisdictions and, and all the stakeholders do to work with you to ensure that the important rural development projects are getting the funds they need? We know you've been a huge champion of, of transportation projects in your district through grants um, and through the, the RAISE project. And so what are things that we can, uh, that, that you can be doing or that we can be discussing as a as a stakeholder community on these projects to make sure those rural development projects get funded and then as a as a second piece to that be really interested in your thoughts from from your perspective on when you think that money will start to flow down because as as we're all seeing this is very new everyone is sort of um creating this as we go and so you know interested to see what your perspective is on the time on the timing of this large bill and the spending coming down well, when is a, is a good question. And I really hope that it's very, very soon and that we start, uh, we get those done. But, you know, um, a lot of that, you know, we've already requested a timeline from the Department of Transportation so that we can get, get an idea of what they're looking at, because there's obviously things they're going to be uh, you, putting together to implement and get the get the information for the grants and things like that. The other concern that I have is that we make sure that they're reasonable requests when we're putting together these, uh, putting together the grants. And I know that Fargo, Fargo Moorhead or Fargo and Moorhead, um, you know, are, are able to put together the grants and things like that. But we want to make sure that the smaller towns too have the opportunity to, to look at those and make sure that they're not so cumbersome that it's impossible for them to get those uh, get the uh, requests in. So, but I, I hope that they do it very soon. We will continue to follow up on the, uh, you know, with the Department of Transportation to make sure, and I, you know, make sure that it's being done in a timely manner and get it out there as soon as we can. You know, as for how we can, I think was the was the first part of the question, and I answered it backwards. But that's <laughs> all right, I asked them together. <laughs> But, you know, I think um, continuing the conversation and making sure that if there are things that we can do to help either to expedite letters of support, things like that, 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 the, that the towns may need. And if there are um, over, overly burdensome regulations, letting us know um, so that if there's a way we can help either, you know, talk to the department and, and uh, make sure those are being taken care of. But, but I think the biggest, what I can say, and just kind of the takeaway is, is keep in touch on those so that we have so that as as it progresses as that money becomes available as those grants become available we are we're having that conversation and can support those cities in any way possible fantastic so even though it's all the mostly interconnected wanted to switch gears a little bit um, to to work on agriculture and ask the question of what can congress and the federal government do to help address the supply chain backlog and or the shortages of truck drivers to help manufacturers and then agriculture producers. And obviously a lot of that, um, that also would, would lead into other questions about roads and bridges, but, but interested in your thoughts on that. Well, 
And I really am glad that you asked the question about supply chain because it has been a huge issue and it is something that we are hearing um, about, uh, you know, everywhere in the district, um, whether it be the ag industry, whether it be manufacturers, there is, um, and, and then of course, I think the TV talks a lot about not being able to get your Christmas gifts in time. <laughs> so there is a lot going on with that. And, and um, Senator Mike Lee and myself, uh, we put together an I didn't name it, but it's the Stop the Grinch Act. Um, <laughs> but it's really just a, it's addressing the supply chain issue. And it looks at, um, it, you know, it would ask for um, some relief with, uh, with truck drivers and the hours they're driving. And it really, really focuses on the ports and some of the Jones Act provisions, but trying to loosen things up so that we are able to get those trucks and get them out there. It also looks at... Um, uh, military vehicles, if there is a way that we can use those and account for those, making sure that we could um, get things if we need additional trucks. In addition to that, um, we talk a lot about empty containers going back. We would be looking at federal lands in order to um, in order to store empty containers so that they would have the opportunity to leave them there instead of sending them back. So that's um, there. There are some answers there. Uh, you know, addressing the supply chain. I know that the ag industry has been talking a lot about right now about the fertilizer issues and the and the uh, trade and the tariffs. And uh, if we can if we can address some of those issues, I think that's I believe that's um, uh, in in court right now uh, against one of the against one of the large manufacturers. But you know, we need to continue. I don't think there's one answer to it. Um, because there's there's a lot of things that are happening, you know, as we look at not only the Jones Act, and that has to do with, uh, you know, the actual shipping, but we're looking at getting, getting um, it, once it gets here, getting it off and getting it to where it needs to go. So then we're talking trucking, and we're talking about uh, making sure that we have not only the, the trucks, but we have the truckers available. So, so there's a lot of things, but I think that that Stop the Grinch Act um, addresses some of that. And hopefully we will continue to push that. Well, I like the name, so I think you should just own it because I think it's a good name. And and you know, there's so many so many pieces of legislation that if you have a, a, a bill like that with a with a name that people will remember, I think that can always be a good thing. But um, you know, what's really sad is I will tell you my staff, and and I'm going off, I'm going off, uh, you know, off topic, but we were at a we were at a grocery store on a tour, and you know how they set like can or. I guess uh, boxes of pop-ups so that they make make yeah. pictures. There was a Grinch <laughs> out, of, out of Mountain Dew because it was green. So they made me stand in front of it and get my picture taken. So so well, there's Grinch there, there stand for anything, or is it just really representative? Because you know that that's my favorite thing about legislation is that they can make acronyms. They can just make words out of acronyms that sort of make sense, but not. <laughs> it would be a stretch. No, it's just it's just cute. <laughs> well, and, and on that point, I guess, and I think you probably answered some of this already, but because agriculture producers need roads, bridges, and rail to get their product to market, um, and issues with of infrastructure and agriculture often overlap, are, do you see any other major issues as top infrastructure issues facing the agriculture communities um, and any steps that can be taken? Um, you know, we had the supply chain conversation, but other issues with infrastructure that that may, if, if you want to add on, and, and we, you know, you you touched on this with with the truckers and things like that, but just interesting if there's any other pieces to that. Well, and, and you know, I will I will kind of go back to that. I think the truckers are is a huge issue for you know when we're talking about getting those commodities to market, um, and so that is one of the things there. Are, and I know there's other pieces of legislation that look at some of the things in the Grin in Stop the Grinch Act are temporary. But I think there's some more permanent solutions, you know, as we look at um, the age to cross, you know, an age a truck driver can cross state lines, things like that, encouraging more truck drivers. But in, in, in the end, they need a decent road to drive those trucks on. So and, and like I said earlier, there's so many steps to it because it's, you know, you've got the truckers, you've got the roads, you've got. But I think that we need to continue and and. And mentioned earlier, one of the reasons I was disappointed in the in the infrastructure bill is that I don't think it put enough money into those because it really is, um, you know, the the money in the infrastructure bill for railroads, you know, on the on the East Coast does us no good. It doesn't get one, you know, commodity to market um, with the with the passenger rail 
um, on the East Coast. And so we have to recognize, and it's something, it's a, it's a continual effort on our part for many of the rural, um, for many of the rural members to remind people that we have roads. That is what we have. And that is how we get our, our products to market and we have to make sure that those roads are decent. And so it, it is, It is. I think that that's one of the things uh, that, uh, that we need to continue to push and making sure there's enough money for that, um, that is focused on roads and not um, electric plug-in, car plug-ins and things like that, because they're, we need the practical part, which is uh, roads and bridges to make sure that we can do that. So, um, and, and like I mentioned before, we, uh, we also need to make sure that we have the truck drivers but one of the things that, um, you know, not only infrastructure, but making sure that we have those strong rural communities, that's been, um, that's been something I've been talking about for a while about those, making sure, because we have, we have workforce needs in, in rural areas, North and South Dakota and Minnesota, all of those places we have workforce issues and we need to make sure that we are able to attract people. So we've got to make sure that we've got education. We've got to make sure that we have the broadband. We've got to make sure we have decent health care in those rural areas, because when you are trying to, and, and I know that housing has been a big issue for a lot of areas, mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that we have housing for those folks and not, not just low income housing, because that's been such a focus um, in, you know, in so many, in so many levels of government that, that low income housing, but we need market rate housing. We need housing for people who are working, and um, and I, I use the example a few times. But there was one of um, one of the uh, cities in my district I was talking to. They actually have empty low income housing, I mean, not completely, but they have several units because the folks came in, they lived there, they were working, and they made too much money to stay there. So now they have to try to find something else and there's nothing else available. Um, so we have to make sure that we are doing what we can to encourage also, you know, that market rate housing, whether it be apartments or single family, but to attract our, uh, the workforce that we need, we need to make sure that that's available too. So there's a, a lot of things going on in, in that answer, but, you know, there's so much that goes into making sure that Rome, Minnesota stays, stays strong. No, you're, I mean, it's fascinating because it is it, it is all interconnected. Uh, you can't just move one piece without moving the rest. And I think, um, you know, uh, you've talked about broadband as a part of infrastructure and as a part of your um, bipartisan bill. Um, uh, you discussed that a little bit, but that actually begs the question or, or, or leads to the question is, on that front, um, one any any other points on your on uh, of interest on the bipartisan uh, broadband bill that you did pass out of the ag committee, and then any other bipartisan piece of legislation that you've been working on, um, and and if what you see is the chances of of passing because there is there are so many moving pieces that um, you know I think other members of the panels have said earlier you know Congress wants to move forward with this. So where are you seeing those, those opportunities for bipartisan? But first, I think it would be really interesting if there's anything else you'd like to say about your broadband bill, um, because I know that's something you, you worked very uh, hard on and, and we've been tracking closely. Well, in the broadband bill, you know, I, I'm the ranking on the Ag Committee. I'm the ranking member on the Commodity Exchanges and Energy and Credit uh, Subcommittee. And that actually oversees the broadband issue. And so that's, so we put together, we originally put together, and, and I'm looking at the names because you mentioned the names. We originally put together the Broadband for Rural America Act, and then the actual bill that passed was the Broadband Internet Connections for Rural America Act, because, um, and that was, that, you know, a lot of that original bill that we did put together, you know, was put into the bill, and that was a bipartisan bill that and, and passed unanimously. But what that really did was it really, um, it focused on some of the issues that are going on. I know that is, is um, a lot of the communities are looking at uh, broadband, whether a there's one of the issues of, um, if a contract in an area has been, um, has been awarded, then that area, that contract is tied up, that area is tied up. And someone, and if that, company that got that contract can't fulfill that contract, it still sits there. So someone else can't come in. So there are some things like little glitches like that, that are holding up, um, holding up broadband in certain areas. There's also the issue of mapping. Um, 
having a good map of actually understanding because um, some of the uh, some of the older maps are are not as good, but we need a map uh, to show us um, exactly where people where they're at, where is their broadband, what's you know what's the level of broadband they're being delivered, and is it actually getting to the door? Is it just fiber? Is it just fiber that's going by their house, or is it actually at their house? And so we need to have a better understanding of exactly where we're lacking and where we need to go. The other thing that was a big one um, that was uh, important in our bill was the USD. We put it under the USDA because we really felt like the USDA understood um, understood rural America better and could better address the issues of getting it to where it needed to get. Um, and, and like I said, unfortunately, they chose not to take a lot of that, but it is something we will continue to pursue and getting some of those. Um, as a matter of fact, putting together, I, I had some meetings, um, I guess it was last week with uh, uh, electric co-ops and some other that, um, that pointed out some very specific issues and we're putting together a letter to get that to the department in order to um, address those and see where they're at. So they're, they're you know, where there's a, actually one of them was there's an old contract that's, uh, that someone got a loan 20 years ago uh, for some internet and now it disqualifies entire chunks of um, chunks of this county. So we're trying to figure out how we can get that uh, how we can get that fixed so that they could qualify for some of the new broadband money instead of just the old 20 year old internet money. <laughs> But uh, so, and, and if somebody runs into anything like that, please let us know. But I think some of those maybe more specific issues are at the point where we need to just address them very, um, very specifically. We are putting a lot, a lot of money into broadband right now. And so I want to make sure we're using it wisely and it's getting to where it needs to get and that people are being served. And that's what concerns me is, you know, we talk about... Uh, I want to say it was a 42 million or some a huge amount of money in that infrastructure bill. And we want to make sure that it's being used wisely and it's getting the internet out there. That's great. Thank you for that. And, and so just to that point, it sounds like you and in your subcommittee and committee have had some um, success at having some bipartisan movement on these critical issues. Um, are there other areas that uh, you see as, um, as moving forward in a bipartisan manner or that you have worked on with other members, either of the Minnesota delegation uh, in the Senate or, or other members across the, the country that you see as, and, and the likelihood of passing. Well, and I'm sorry, you did ask that and I oh. just kind of went off on broadband. <laughs> Our question is we started back on broadband, so don't, don't worry about it. I wanted to just clarify. You know there are there are there are bipartisan things that we are working on. You know not only um, not only those. There's also been um, some of the WIP plus. I will just say in ag committee we're very bipartisan. Some of the um, relief programs for the drought things like that. But in particular, you know with um, with Congresswoman Angie Craig from Minnesota, I'm on her with uh, the E15. So to, so to put year round E15 in um, in in place. Um, you know, she's, she's controlling that. So I don't know exactly. I'm, we're hoping they're certainly pushing it. I don't know exactly where she's at. We're, we're running out of vehicles for things before the end of the year. Um, but we'll continue to push that. There are other, um, you know, just, uh, and seeing they're not as big bills that you don't hear about on the news every night, but you know, other bills uh, regarding some um, court procedures that we're working, I'm working with a gentleman from New York and different things like that. So there's there's always a, there's always those things kind of going on, um, and I won't say behind the scenes because it's transparent. It's just that you don't hear about it on the news because they're not as exciting. <laughs> well, right. There's a, there is a lot going on, and and I know yeah you may be pulled for votes in in here in just a moment, but I guess to to wrap up and just first of all thank you so much for this conversation. It is really really fascinating, and I would uh, I think it would be interesting. I mean, we, you joined us for this panel last year, which we appreciated so much. And, and just hearing you talk about all of those things that are happening that aren't on the news and that aren't capturing people's attention. Is there anything that you would share or think about that has been the biggest sort of surprise or the biggest, um, you know, aha moment in terms of those things that you are working on that are, as a member of Congress now, you are doing day in and day out that, that folks just, uh, that are, um, you know, maybe not rising to the top, but are so very critical to the work and to the seventh district. 
you know, it, I, I would just see there's there's a lot of uh, smaller bills that you know even even in the Minnesota Senate, you know, you, you kind of knew what was going on and people heard about the bills, but. Uh, on the federal level, I don't think people hear about most of what we're doing. You know, I, we had Judiciary Committee today and we, we sent through five bills, one of them, and, and I guess I, you wouldn't have known that, uh, that lynching wasn't, uh, um, lynching by itself was not illegal in, in, the, in the United States. You would think, yes, it was, but it was covered under other statutes. So we have a, um, so there's things like that that are going on that I don't think people hear about that I, I didn't realize it's a, and it's a little bit different than the state government because you have hearings on things, but you don't necessarily, you have informational hearings. There's a lot more informational hearings um, just about general topics. I think people as they're forming ideas, you know, have these and bring people in. And then once you have the bill in front of you, you don't necessarily hear from the stakeholders. You had, you hear from the stakeholders before, so they have input. Um, I, I will say one of the things that I thought that we would be doing right away would be working on the on the farm bill. We haven't we haven't really started on that yet. We've had um, hearings on a variety of things in the ag committee, um, so I won't say it's an aha moment, um, you know. But it I, I really think we should be uh, getting to work on that farm bill because it is a big um, undertaking and it's uh, it's coming due. Um, you know. I don't know if there was an aha moment because we kind of, um, you know, you just kind of, you, you, you go in with both feet first. I mean, it's, you're just, you're here, you're in DC and you, you need to know where you're supposed to be um, at, at the right time. So, but I will say that I have found it very, very, um, you know, it's very fulfilling and talking to people is, you know, an understanding, um, what the needs are um, and what the effects of the regulations and the kinds of things that we are passing on the federal level um, has in Minnesota. And I will, I always kind of joke and say, you know, there's a lot of neat ideas in DC, but they're not always neat for Minnesota or North Dakota. Sometimes they're very bad for them. And so that is something we are continuing to um, watch out for. But the, but I think between talking to the constituents and folks coming out to visit now, and even the Zooms, um, you know, because we've, we've learned to really um, rely a lot on Zoom are very important so that we can continue to represent you um, and represent everyone and to make the best decisions for, um, for rural America. Well, that's fantastic. Well, I just want to uh, thank you again for your time today, Congresswoman Fishbach, and it's just been a, a pleasure this year um, to to work with you in your office and look forward to to others. And I know um, that the group here appreciates um, your uh, input and your uh, thoughts and candor today. So thank you so much. And um, we can conclude uh, this portion of the panel. Well, thank you very, very much. And I will say it again, please, if there's anything, any questions that you have um, and or any concerns, please feel free to reach out to us anytime and, um, and appreciate the opportunity to say a few words today. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Well, that was fantastic. So um, we, as I mentioned at the, at the opening of this panel, uh, Senator Klobuchar is unable to join us live today because she will be, or she is chairing a rules committee. Um, but I'd like to introduce uh, a video from her on infrastructure and her thoughts there. Um, and and uh, though she may not need introduction in this group, um, I'll just I'll just uh, give a, a brief overview of her of her time and tenure in the Senate and before. Senator Klobuchar, uh, Amy Klobuchar from Minnesota, was first elected in 2006 and reelected for a third term in 2018. She serves. Um, uh, on the Judiciary Committee as, and is chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Antitrust, a Competition Policy, and Consumer Rights. Additionally, she chairs the Rules, uh, the Rules Administration Committee, which she is chairing today, uh, as well as the Senate Democratic Steering and Outreach Committee. She's a member of the Commerce, Science, Transportation Committee, the Agriculture Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee. Prior to being elected to the Senate as the first woman to represent the, the state of Minnesota, uh, she had the largest prosecutor's office in Minnesota for eight years from 1998 to 2006. So we look forward to hearing her remarks here and then we will wrap up. Hello and happy holidays to everyone attending the Fargo-Moorhead West Fargo Chamber of Commerce 
2021 Policy Outlook Series. I'm wearing my Christmas green today. I'd like to thank Shannon Full, President of the Chamber, and your entire staff for hosting this forum. And I'd like to thank my colleagues, Senator John Hoven, Tina Smith, Kevin Kramer, and Representative Michelle Fishbach, and also Representative Kelly Armstrong for being a part of today's event. The Chamber has been a vital resource for so many businesses during this challenging time. From helping your members survive some of the harshest impacts of the pandemic to ensuring they can thrive as we rebuild our economy, you do so much to make the region a great place to live, work, and do business. Back in September, I had the opportunity to meet with several local business leaders when I joined Senator Hoven in Fargo to talk about our work on rural exports. In 2019 and 2020, John and I successfully secured federal funding for a rural export center to help rural businesses export their products to new international markets. Now we're leading efforts to pass legislation to make it permanent. Small businesses in rural areas shouldn't be denied opportunities just because of their location. And our bill will boost exports and advance innovation in our rural areas so that they can continue to grow. We're going to keep working together across the aisle and across the river to get our bill signed into law so that businesses in Minnesota and North Dakota can benefit for years to come. We're also focused on addressing the flooding issues that have been a huge issue for our region. Back in April, we met with local officials in Fargo to talk about the Fargo-Moorhead Diversion Project. And last month, Senator Hoven and I took to the floor of the Senate to get Michael Connor confirmed as Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works so that he can keep the ball rolling. You know how important this is. The Red River has exceeded flood stage 55 times since 1902 which is alarming on its own. Every year they say it's the worst flood ever, the worst flood in decades. And then mother nature basically says, hold my beer, and it happens again. The problem has actually worsened in recent years with seven of the top 10 floods occurring during the last three decades. As we've begun to see, as we've begun to see more and more severe impacts from frequent extreme weather events, water management and resiliency will be increasingly important for families and businesses alike. So I'm gonna keep fighting until we get this project done. That's gonna go a long way towards strengthening the local economy, but there's still more to do. I'm sure you've seen the pictures of rail cars backed up for dozens of miles in crowded ports. And I bet each one of you knows a couple roads or bridges in your community that are in need of serious repair. So we worked across the aisle to come up with a solution. That's the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which was supported by 19 Republican senators, including Senator Hoven and Senator Kramer, and of course, Senator Smith and myself. This legislation makes a once in a generation investment in our roads, bridges, highways, ports, and rail. I also fought to make sure that it included the largest investment our country has ever made in high-speed internet. The bulk of this funding will go directly to states to expand high-speed internet access across the country, starting with areas that completely lack connectivity. You know how significant this will be for the region. With high-speed internet access, many businesses will be able to reach new customers and our farmers will be able to take advantage of precision technology that can detect things like soil moisture and tractors that can use wireless connections to send data back to farms. Not only will this help farmers and ranchers, it will help stabilize our food supply and conserve water. So what does the bill mean for the region? Fewer potholes, more reliable Wi-Fi, safer bridges, less traffic, a stronger supply chain with things like freight rail, high-speed internet for tens of thousands of Minnesotans and North Dakotans who currently lack it and more good paying jobs. I also wanna mention the Farm Bill is coming up and it's been really, really important part of my work to be a member of the Agriculture Committee. I'm important, I'm really looking forward uh, to working on those issues uh, with Senator Hoven and Senator Smith who also serve on the committee. I wanna thank Senator Kramer uh, for working with me on Save Our Stages. Uh, that kept the Fargo Theater as well as the Moorhead Amphitheater going. I led that bill with Senator John Cornyn and I know how important it is to the region. 
Finally, I want to talk about an issue that I hear about all the time from businesses, not just in your region, from across the state, workforce shortages. Simply put, businesses are having trouble finding workers with the right skills to fill in-demand jobs. And at the same time, we have a lot of workers struggling to find work that aligns with their skills. That's why I lead bipartisan legislation to invest in apprenticeship programs and skills training. Because in the next 10 years, we're not going to have a shortage of sports marketing degrees. We're going to have a shortage of construction workers, a shortage of plumbers and electricians and commercial truck drivers and mechanics and healthcare workers. Apprenticeships and skills training are good for employers in search of workers and workers in search of steady employment. So I'm going to keep focused on workforce development, which of course also includes housing and child care. And by the way, more work on immigration reform and work permits and visas, because we must make sure we have a workforce that fits the 21st century. Thank you again for inviting me to share a few words today. All of you do so much to strengthen your community, keeping your business going through the worst of times but it's been so good for this region and our entire economy. I look forward to working with you in the years ahead. I love that the river doesn't divide us. It brings us together. Enjoy the rest of the series. You deserve it. Well, thank you to Senator Klobuchar for sending greetings. We look forward to her joining us next year. Well, that is all the time we have for day two of the Chamber's Policy Outlook series. Again, thank you to the Senator and to Congresswoman Fishbach for their time on this panel. And before concluding, I just wanna thank both Minnesota and, and North Dakota's entire congressional delegation uh, for our area for joining us this afternoon. And we look forward to continued partnership. Uh, lastly, I wanna invite all of you to join us tomorrow, Thursday, December 9th, at 9 a.m. Central for our North Dakota policy panel. You can join us using the same link uh, or watch the live stream on Facebook. So thank you all, and we look forward to seeing you at 9 a.m. tomorrow. Take care.